Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we have a case of men being discriminated against in hearings at colleges when it comes to harassment claims. This is the case of David Oto Swake versus Arizona Board of Regents. In this case, a PhD student was accused of bad things and it interfered with his abilities and he was basically denied due process. And so the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is analyzing this case and whether or not David over here was maltreated and whether or not it's a Title IX violation which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Both sexes, either sex. So yes, you can't discriminate against men either. So was this man being discriminated against? Let's find out from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Let's get started with this. This case concerns an Arizona State University, the university, disciplinary case against David Oto Swake for alleged violations of the university student code of conduct. The student code triggered by another student's complaint that Swake had engaged in unwanted contact and sexual misconduct. The student had brought this suit because of the university's handling of the disciplinary case against him. In relevant part, he claimed the university violated Title IX of the United States Code, which is 20 U.S.C. 1681, because it's a federally funded educational institution that discriminated against him on the basis of sex during the course of a disciplinary case. We must decide whether the student plausibly alleges the university discriminated against him on the basis of sex. In the summer and fall of 2004, Schwaik was a university graduate student pursuing a PhD in microbiology. For over three years, he worked in campus lab as a student researcher along other PhD students, including the student who made the misconduct allegation against him, the complaint. Schwaik and the complainant oscillated between a professional and dozen of romantic encounter relationships between February 2013 and 2014, so an on and off again romantic relationship in the lab. On August the 14th, 2014, Schwaik received a letter from Norian Sablin, a senior coordinator with the university's Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. Always exciting. The letter notified him of a complaint against him concerning multiple instances of inappropriate behavior and unwanted verbal and physical content with the complainant. The letter informed Schwake of three pending disciplinary acts against him for student code violations including unwanted or repeated significant behavior and misconduct. So yeah, this student had an on again, off again relationship with this other student, both PhD students in this microbiology lab. And apparently the one student is complaining against the other student for unwanted touching and stuff. So, you know, again, as always, you have to wonder what the incentives of various people in this. Could, could this be a false claim? Not that such a thing could ever happen because we, because we believe women and women could never in any way misremember, exaggerate, or mis, misperceive, or in any way um, lie, ex, ex, expand. They, they just always tell the truth, don't you know? And also because there's no difference between men and women because they're exactly the same. That also means that a man can never tell a lie because men and women are exactly the same and therefore men are women. And therefore, since women can never lie, men can never lie. And what are the rules again? I get so confused. I'm so sorry. I don't understand the, I don't understand the rules of SJW. Women, women are to be believed, but there's no difference between men and women and they're exactly the same. So that means that men have to be believed. And okay, I'm, I'm confused again. I don't know. Okay, never mind. Schwake and S Sablin met a second time on August 22nd, 2014 to discuss the complaint. Schwake provided, at Sablin's request, a four-page written account of the most serious allegation that he touched the other student's breasts without consent while she was sleeping sometime between March 26th and March 27th. Okay, just on a purely pragmatic level, how do you know if that happened? How do you know if you were sleeping, if another student touched you or not because you were sleeping so uh, this allegation uh, but it must have occurred because it she said it did even though she was sleeping at the time schwake provided at sablin's request this four-page account which included text messages so he's the student the male student has text messages which confirmed the activity on the night of the accusation was consensual and the two had a friendly and romantic relationship for several months afterwards so there's text messages Schwake stated that several students and staff members could corroborate his on-again, off-again relationship with the complainant and their consensual contact. He suggested the complainant may have been deliberately provided by false information or left out key details. Not that such a thing is impossible in any way whatsoever. On September the 5th, 2014, Schwake received a letter from Sablin 
which is claimed the university had found him responsible for the disciplinary charges. So he he's guilty of this thing somehow. He was suspended until fall of 2017. So that's three years. So yeah, he, in September of 2014, he receives a letter saying he's suspended until fall of 2017. Effective immediately, unless he requested a hearing, under the rules of the disciplinary procedure, he could have a legal representation, he could cross-examine witnesses and present evidence of witnesses in his favor. So the school says, we are going to suspend you for three years unless you request a hearing. And if you request a hearing, you're entitled to a lawyer. You're entitled to, you know, I mean, you have to provide one, but you're entitled to have one, which is nice. You're entitled to cross-examination and you're entitled to present evidence. So you're entitled to a hearing. So it's like, yeah, I'd probably like a hearing. That'd be nice. In fall of 2014, a lawyer who Schwake had retained formally requested an appeal to the university decision. So the guy hired a lawyer to represent him. Good move. And he says, I would like a formal hearing. Okay. On November the 3rd, 2014, Dr. Hicks notified Schwake that the university had received a report that he was seen in the lab in violation of lab access restrictions and two student code provisions. Dr. Hicks then placed Schwake on immediate immediate interim suspension. So he was denied access to the lab. They said, oh, we found you in the lab. And a mandatory in-person meeting two days later, Schwake maintained he didn't enter the lab, but he only entered and quickly left the building in which the lab was located. So I didn't actually violate your rules. Dr. Hicks explained the suspension would remain in place unless evidence proved no violation. So this is this is very Kafka-esque, right? The, the school says, we have evidence that you violated the lab. They said, no, I didn't enter the lab. I entered the building in which the lab was at, what, what lab was in, but I didn't actually enter the lab, so I didn't violate your rules. And he said, well, the suspension is valid unless you prove you didn't violate the rules. So it's up to you to prove you didn't enter the lab. Not us to, up to us that you, the, that you entered the lab, but up to you to prove it. So that's very Kafka-esque. At Schwake's request, the university surveillance security department employed in surveillance footage uh, confirming the account. So there was surveillance footage which showed him entering and exiting in relatively quick succession. So he was able to prov provide evidence, even though the burden on, on proof is on him for some reason, because he's a guy, I guess. I don't know. On November the 13th, 2014, Schwake received notice. The appeal hearing in his disciplinary ca case was set for December the 12th. Eight days after receiving that notice, Dr. Hicks forcibly withdrew Schwake's graduation application. So even though he's appealed, and even though he's set to graduate, Dr. Hicks is forcibly withdrawing his request to graduate. Thereafter, Schwake learned that the complainant had attempted to coerce members of the lab to testify against him by falsely telling them that other lab members had agreed to do so. So, so yeah, the, the school, he wants to graduate and the school is forcibly withdrawing his application. And also we've learned that the student who's alleging this is going around and trying to coerce students into testifying, which is also a super promising move. The school is going to do absolutely nothing about because of because guy on December the 3rd, 2014, Schwake and his lawyer met with Dr. Hicks at the university police decision. Again, really good move on this guy getting a lawyer. The, the school will treat you differently when you have a lawyer. So get a lawyer. Schwake's lawyer and Dr. Hicks came up with a mutually beneficial compromise that allowed Schwake to graduate by changing his punishment from a suspension to certain campus restrictions. So his lawyer his lawyer is doing a reasonable good job. Look, all I want to do is graduate anyway. Look, I don't want to be at your school anyway. I just want to graduate. So his lawyer is like, okay, fine. How about we compromise? How about we compromise? And we simply say, rather than suspending him, how about you just let him graduate? That'd be good. So as, his, as a lawyer, I approve of this guy's lawyer's actions. The guy has filed an application to graduate anyway. Why not just let him graduate? How about we compromise? You let him graduate and he just doesn't, go certain places and we'll all move along with our lives. How about that? So as a result of this request, Dr. Hicks explained that Schwake was not Schwake was not entitled to a hearing. So you're not entitled to the hearing anymore. Wait, what? When Schwake protested, Dr. Hicks stated this decision was final. The university had no appeal process available. When Schwake asked Dr. Hicks where he could file a complaint against the complainants, Dr. Hicks denied telling Schwake on multiple prior occasions, he could not do so until after the hearing because it would be seen as retaliatory. Dr. Hicks then told Schwake filing his own complaint could lead to further investigation and sanctions, including a degree rev revocation. The male student over here and his lawyer say, how about a compromise? How about you allow me to graduate? And the school says, okay, fine, but you can't file an appeal anymore. It's like, wait a second, what? So I still have this disciplinary thing on my record, even though I can graduate. Now, that, doesn't, that doesn't quite work. 
And he says, well, can I file a complaint against the complainant? And the doctor says, well, I never told you you couldn't. And he says, yes, you did. You told me many times I couldn't. And I said, I never said that. And then he says, yeah, you can file a complainant. But if you do, if you file a complainant, if you file a complaint against the complainant, if you file a complaint for sexual discrimination, we'll revoke your degree. So if you avail yourselves of the process we gave the woman, we're going to revoke your degree. So just go away and never complain. That's not discriminatory in any way. The following day, Schwake received a letter with the university's final decision outlining the restrictions. A three-year restriction on accessing certain college buildings, including the lab, a three-year ban on holding any paid or voluntary position at the university, including a postdoc position for spring 2015, and a prohibition on any contact with the complainant with no end duration, so no contact order. Although Schwake did graduate, the disciplinary case disrupted the dissertation, interfered with his research, caused him to lose funding and employment opportunities, and damaged his reputation. So, you know, we didn't give you a degree, but we're going to ban you for three years from entering any places. So you can't get a postdoc. You can't get as harmed your reputation, all stuff. And we can't give you any kind of review. And you can't file a complaint because you're a guy. And if you do, we'll revoke your degree, even though you earned it, because you've had the temerity to file a complaint. So this due process thing seems to be going over super duper well here at the University of Arizona. So what's the Ninth Circuit going to do about it? Let's read on. Title IX of the Civil Rights Act provides that no person in the United States shall, on basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX is enforceable by an individual through an implied right of private action in which monetary damages are available. To state a, private, a Title IX claim, a plaintiff must plead that defendant educational institution, institution receives federal funding, which they pretty much all do, because federal grants and federal scholarships work for this. The plaintiff was excluded from participation in, denied the benefit of, or subjected to discrimination under educational program activity, and it occurred on the basis of sex. Title IX encompasses diverse forms of intentional discrimination. Title IX bars the imposition of university discipline where gender is a motivating factor in the discipline. So if gender or sex is what is motivating this, that you can't do that. Based on its view of the claims of gender bias to be expected in this context, the Second Circuit has articulated so-called erroneous outcome and selective enforcement tests. Pursuant to erroneous outcome tests, the plaintiff must allege particular facts sufficient to cast some articulable doubt on the accuracy of the outcome of the proceedings. In selective enforcement claims, a plaintiff must allege that regardless of the student's guilt or innocence, the severity of the penalty and or decision to initiate the proceeding was affected by gender. The Sixth Circuit has also expressly adopted these tests, as well as so-called deliberate indifferent tests. So the, so the Ninth Circuit over here is surveying the legal landscape because it doesn't know what to do. So the Ninth Circuit is looking and seeing what other circuits have done, which is, which is persuasive authority. So other circuits, the Second and Sixth Circuit, have looked at some tests, the, 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 the improper outcome or the disparate treatment. So improper outcome, the outcome came out wrong. Or even if it came out correctly, you still treated them improperly because of sex. So these are some tests that maybe we, the Ninth Circuit, can rely on in forming our own case law. Although our court has acknowledged some of these doctrinal tests that other courts have employed in this context, and we've assumed their application, we've not expressly adopted any of them. So we have, we have used them without saying that they're law in our circuit. Faced with that antecedent question, we find persuasive the Seventh Circuit's approach to Title IX context in this context. So... We have never really said what our law is. We've kind of used them, but never really said that's our law. And so we are going to say, well, what the Seventh Circuit did, that's persuasive. So we'll just do what they did, which is always a valid option if you're a court of appeals. Just do what someone else did. So what did the Seventh Circuit do? The Seventh Circuit has explained that these tests need not be considered because at bottom, they all ask the same question. What are the alleged facts, if true, read a plausible inference on the basis of sex? So the Seventh Circuit has said, Look, these tests are super interesting and all, but we don't need them because the the ninth because the law itself sets out its own standard. Was there discrimination on the basis of sex? So that's really the only question we need to ask. We don't need to ask this improper motivation claim. We don't need to ask selective prosecution. We don't need to ask improper outcome. We just need to ask this question the statute asks. Was there discrimination on the basis of sex? Let's let's, let's just leave it at that and nothing more. Which seems 
reasonable because that's what the, the text of the statute says. So was there discrimination on the basis of sex? That's the operative question. And as it turns out, the only operative question because we're in the Ninth Circuit. So let's read on. The district court dismissal Schwach's Title IX claim with prejudice by reasoning that the university's aggressive response to the misconduct allegation is not evidence of gender discrimination. So the district court said no problem. In doing so, however, the district court ignored many allegations in Schwach's complaint that we think are relevant to the sufficiency of Title IX. What's this? Discrimination against men in my Ninth Circuit? Wow! Hewing our limited role at the stage, we first considered the allegations of background indicia of sex discrimination, namely the pressure the university faced concerning its handling of sexual misconduct complaints and gender-based discrimination against men in sexual misconduct cases. So, so the district court said, yeah, no problem. But the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says, hey, district court, you didn't really consider everything you need to consider. Kind of blew past some of these factors here. It, 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 against, against a discrimination claim brought by a man. The Ninth Circuit says, you didn't really consider the discrimination case against the man. Maybe you should consider that. The Ninth Circuit wrote that. Okay, well, you know, it's nice to be surprised every once in a while. Schwach's, Schwake's allegations of pattern-based, gender-based discrimination against male respondents in sexual misconduct cases makes the inference that this was sexual discrimination plausible. Schwake alleges that male respondents in sexual harassment and misconduct cases at the university are invariably found guilty regardless of evidence or lack thereof. Schwake further alleges he's aware of the university's recent disciplinary cases against male respondents in alleged misconduct cases who were all found guilty regardless of evidence. The district court was not free to ignore this non-conclusory and relevant factual allegation. So, so Schwake, Schwake, whatever his name is over here, I apologize for getting his name wrong many, many times. But Schwake over here says, hey, the university has engaged in a pattern of conduct. They keep finding for the women every time, no matter what happens. And the district court said, none of that matters. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, again, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals somehow reaches the conclusion, surprising conclusion that, yeah, you know what? That's a factual allegation. That's a factual allegation. They're hostile. And here's a whole bunch of places they've been hostile. And district court, you were wrong to not consider that they've been hostile. And that might be evidence that they were hostile here. So the pattern of conduct was relevant and something you were actually supposed to consider. The plaintiff's allegations include that every male student accused of sexual misconduct in fall of 2013 and fall and spring 2014 semesters was found responsible. Nearly 90% of students found responsible for sexual misconduct between 2011 and 2014 have male first names. An affidavit from an attorney who represents many students at Miami University discipline proceedings who describes a pattern of the university pursuing investigations concerning male students, but not female students. And the plaintiff's allegation the university investigated him rather than the complainant. The absence of any level of detail from this complaint does not render these conclusory or insufficient. So even though there's not like a huge amount of detail, it doesn't make it conclusory. There is no heightened pleading standard for Title IX claims, so it doesn't like have to prove more. A bare bone allegation will be fine. This point is particularly apt here. It may be difficult for a plaintiff to know the full extent of the alleged discrimination and decision making before discovery allows them to unearth this information, which is controlled by the defendant. Here we are satisfied that Schwake's allegations of contemporary pressure and gender-based discrimination establishes background indicia of sex discrimination relevant to his claim. So the university said, oh, you didn't, you didn't make your pleading with any specificity, any specificity or any details. And the Ninth Circuit somehow reaches the conclusion, the correct conclusion, which is why it amazes me. They reached the correct conclusion that Title IX doesn't require like an, an enhanced pleading standard or an elevated standard standard. We have notice pleading. That's all we have in federal notice pleading. We put you on notice. And these things seem superficially plausible that, you know, whether or not they, the university has done this is a question of fact. Have they done this? And so, yeah, this student can't prove any more at this stage because he doesn't have discovery, information that's in your control. So you have to give him discovery. You have to give over evidence that will make his claims more or less likely. So the district court was wrong to dismiss this out of hand because they never gave the student the chance to collect the information. And he was entitled to because the claims are plausible on their face. 
Although Schwake has alleged background indicia of sex discrimination, he must combine those allegations with facts particular to the case to survive a motion to dismiss. First, the university's September the 5th, 2014 decision. Dr. Seeger's comments that the university had convicted Schwake of the assault and individuals should immediately call the police if they see Schwake in a building layered with criminal overtones onto what was essentially a preliminary finding made by university officials in a school disciplinary case. Dr. Seeger also divulged confidential and privileged information about the disciplinary case, shared graphic details about the assault with other students, and used this case as a pl classroom prompt about how to handle misconduct cases. So he, he breached the privilege in order to inform other people, how, here's how do you make a complaint. Dr. Seeger made these comments despite the fact that Schwake had the right to appeal the university decision, thereby ensuring that one version of the misconduct case would be the publicly known version. So even though he had the right to appeal, only one version is being made known to the public because he prejudiced my case. This alleged conduct reflects an atmosphere of bias against Schwake during the course of disciplinary case. This professor over here is leaking private details of this case, making the private details known, and is using it as a, as a case exemplar in his teachings about here's how to make a complaint. And so students are learning about this bad, bad student and the bad, bad things he did, even though he has a right to appeal. So even though he has a right to appeal and challenge it, the students are learning that he's a bad, horrible, very not very good person. And the the Ninth Circuit says, yeah, this kind of kind of prejudice is this student, this pre the student who has a right to to appeal, and you are ensuring that only the bad version is known, which may or may not be the correct version because he has the right to appeal. And so you're prejudicing him, which shows a bias against men. Ninth Circuit says that there was there were the, there was this, there, this the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit has found systemic discrimination. There is systemic discrimination, and as it turns out, the systemic discrimination was against men. So we found that we found that systemic we found that systemic bias the left has been talking about all this time. Where was the systemic bias? Oh, as it turns out, it was systemic bias against men. I hope that was what you were looking for, people on the left, because we finally found it. We found the systemic discrimination. I hope you're happy. Schwake draws our attention to Dr. Hicks' treatment of him after his lawyer and Dr. Hicks fashioned a new punishment for Schwake that did not involve a suspension. Despite Schwake's repeated protests, Dr. Hicks refused to permit Schwake to appeal the punishment and the university's underlying finding of responsibility on the misconduct in violation of the rules. Contrary to the university's suggestion that there can be no showing of bias because the policy foreclosed appeal, gender bias is a plausible explanation in light of the background indicia of discrimination. In modifying the punishment, the inference may be drawn the university sought to show that it took sexual misconduct complaints seriously by punishing him while simultaneously insulating the finding of responsibility from scrutiny in light of the findings. So you, you were trying to show that you took this seriously while insulating the ability of appeal. So you're taking it seriously by, by denying due process. No, you can't do that. Dr. Hicks' refusal to permit Schwake to file a harassment complaint against the complainant is also probative of bias. So the fact the university wouldn't allow him to complain about the person who complained against him is bias. Dr. Hicks told Schwicks, incidentally, in the presence of his lawyer, which again is another reason to have a lawyer presence. Dr. Hick told Schweck that if he filed a complaint against the complainant, it would result in further investigations and additional sanctions, including a degree revocation. Nice to make the threats in the presence of the guy's lawyer, good move. Dr. Hick's refusal to permit him to pursue a complaint against the complainant is consistent with allegations the university treats male respondents differently in these proceedings because of the Department of Education's investigation into mishandling complaints. So you're discriminating on the basis of sex. Absent the sexual misconduct proceedings and the alleged pressure the university faced regarding his handling of misconduct, the inference may be drawn that Schweik would be able to pursue his own complaint. Schweik's allegations of the university's one-sided investigation support of inference of gender bias. According to Schweik, the university refused to provide him with any written information about the complaint's allegation against him and only orally summarized them, failed to consider his version of events of the assault or to follow up with his witnesses and evidence he offered in his defense, promised him that he'd only consider one accusation at a time, but then suspended him based on additional violations of the code to which he was not given an opportunity to respond and ultimately found him responsible for charges without any access to evidence or considering exculpatory evidence. These allegations echo some of the, echo some of the irregularities on which our sister courts have relied to sustain Title IX claims for sexual discrimination in the context of sexual misconduct disciplinary proceedings. So yeah, you failed to give him any kind of due process. We've heard about this from our other circuits. And yes, once again, we're gonna rule for the men. Men are not inferior. They're entitled to rights too. 
So the the so the men's the men can stand up for themselves and stand proud. We conclude that Schwake stated a Title IX claim against the university because he plausibly alleged gender bias. Accordingly, we reverse and vacate the district court's order and judgment dismissing the claims with prejudice and remand for further proceedings. So that is the end of our current coverage of the case of David Otto Schwake versus Arizona Board of Regents, where the Ninth Circuit somehow reached the right decision. You know, in, in before the Ninth Circuit hears this on bonk and reverses this. But at least for the moment, the Ninth Circuit has come up with the right conclusion. Yes, men and women both cannot be discriminated against. And the university was discriminating against the man. They didn't provide him notice. They didn't provide him a hearing. They denied him due process and all the rest. So this case must go back to trial where David can get discovery. And we can learn whether or not these things are really true. Did they really discriminate against him? So he can get his discovery. He can get evidence and this case can go forward and men should be treated the same as women and vice versa in the college system. So another man wins a Title IX claim. It's a it's a wonderful day in America. And that's the end of the current coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you liked this latest video, please give it a like below and hit the join button. For 99 cents a month, you too can give a recurring membership that helps this channel grow and helps YouTube to recommend this channel to others. We really appreciate your continued financial support and all your love. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.